And in these verses, we see two things. Firstly, in chapter 11, we see disaster prophesied. And secondly, in the first part of chapter 12, we see deliverance promised. Disaster prophesied, deliverance promised. We begin uh, with chapter 11, disaster prophesied. As the chapter begins, uh, God's people, the children of Israel, are in the land of Egypt, and they are there in slavery. They've been there for 400 years. They've been crying to the Lord for deliverance. And God has sent them a saviour, somebody to rescue them and to lead them out into freedom. His name is Moses, uh, and his brother Aaron has come with him. Uh, but Moses is the leader, uh, the deliverer, as it were, of God's people uh, at that time. And uh, we read in chapter 4 of the book of Exodus that Moses goes to Pharaoh, the ruler of the land of Egypt, uh, with not a request, but with an instruction, with a command from the Lord God Almighty. And the command is very simple, let my people go. And Pharaoh's response is, who is the Lord that I should obey him? And God gave through Moses a great warning to Pharaoh. God said to Moses before he went to speak to the ruler of the land of Egypt, Thus you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed I will kill your son, your firstborn. So God had given that warning to, Moses, uh, to Pharaoh through Moses. Let my people go. If you don't, there will be a great judgment upon your disobedience. And notice that warning was given in chapter 4. Pharaoh wouldn't listen. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? Who is he? What authority does he have over me? Why should I listen to a word he has to say? I'm the most powerful person on the planet. I don't take instructions from anybody. I give instructions. And so Pharaoh refuses to let the children of Israel go. And so surely then we find straight away in chapter 4, God brings forth this great judgment upon Pharaoh, the death of the firstborn. Surely? No. We don't find that. God doesn't rush to that judgment. God holds off. God relents. Why? That's the grace of God. That's the patience and the long-suffering of God with sinners, that he gives Pharaoh time to repent. The instruction is given, let my people go. Pharaoh doesn't listen God gives another opportunity and another opportunity and another opportunity for Pharaoh to heed his words. And there are other judgments that when Pharaoh won't let the people go, God does bring certain judgments upon the land, certain plagues. But he doesn't, can I put it this way, he doesn't go nuclear straight away. God gives Pharaoh plenty of opportunity to turn from his disobedience and to obey the word of the Lord. But sadly, Pharaoh spurns the God's amazing patience. And so, his opportunity is gone. There is no coming back from this now. And so, in chapter 11, verse 1, we read, the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. It's the plague I spoke of back in chapter 4. It's the plague I've withheld. It's the plague I've kept back for now in grace. But he hasn't listened. He's hardened his own heart against me. And so this is it. The day of grace is over. And this judgment must and so we read uh, in verse 4, 
uh, Moses gives the word of the Lord to Pharaoh again. Here it is, chapter 11, verse 4. About midnight, I will, God, I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals, this is going to be a comprehensive judgment. Everyone's going to feel it from the highest to the lowest. And then verse 6, a comprehensive judgment. Verse 6, a devastating judgment. Then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. You might think that sounds extreme. You might think that's rather heavy-handed of the Lord. But it's a sobering reminder to us, and we need it, that sin is deadly serious. The heart of sin is what we saw in Pharaoh. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? That's sin and the root. We tend to talk about sins, don't we? Don't do that, that's a sin or whatever. We talk about the outward expression, but sin at its root is a an attitude of mind. And it's an attitude of rejection of God's authority and rebellion against his words. And that's the state of all of us by nature. We are born with that inbuilt rejection of the Lord. Our hearts turned away from him. And so we live our lives really with this over them. Who is the Lord? that I should obey him. I'm my own Lord. That was Pharaoh's attitude, wasn't it? I'm the most powerful man on the planet. I march to my own beat. I do my own thing. I decide what is right and what is wrong. That's sin. It was in Pharaoh's heart. It's in everyone's heart. And it's a, a wretched thing in the sight of the Lord who created us, who gave us the life we have that we use to reject him. And the God who in common grace gives us all things richly to enjoy. And we say, get away from me. In a sense, by nature, we're all Christ crucifiers. We all, in our hearts, send Jesus to the cross. We don't want this king to rule over us. Away with him. We have no king but ourselves. Sin is a wretched thing. And I think if there's one thing perhaps we need as churches, it is a fresh understanding of the sinfulness of sin. The Puritans, I think, talked about the loathsomeness of sin. And we see it in an incident like this, how serious it is. God is always, God is never disproportionate. He's a righteous God, which means he always acts rightly. In our legal system, uh, sometimes, or with parents or whatever, sometimes perhaps you're a parent, I'm a parent now, uh, and you'll have time to look back, or you do look back now, and sometimes you might think, oh, I was too lenient there, I should have been firmer. Or there may be an occasion when you look back and think, I was too firm there. I came down too hard and heavy. God is always proportionate in his response. And so the fact that this should be the proportionate response is a reminder of the seriousness of the crime. And what happened that night in the land of Egypt? Death, wasn't it? Death to the firstborn. And that is the penalty for sin. That is the judgment. That is the expression of God's wrath. It is the coming of death. And what happened that night in the land of Egypt was a real historical event. Uh, but it was also a picture. It was a metaphor, a real historical event, which served as a metaphor. Because what happened that night was a foretaste of another day when God will bring judgment upon those who reject him, on those who say in their heart, like Pharaoh, who is the Lord that I should obey him. Because we read in Scripture that God is patient. 
God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so here we are, and if we're Christians here today, we get on our knees and say, thank you, Lord, that you were patient. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't go nuclear at the very beginning. Thank you, Lord, that you gave me opportunity to repent. And the Lord does. And perhaps you're not a Christian here this morning, and God is being gloriously patient with you. Because here you are sitting, perhaps, and in your heart, even as I preach, you're saying, I, I don't want this. I don't want to listen to this, Lord. I don't want to believe that his word has authority over my life. And God is patient. And God spares you. And God doesn't visit his judgment and his wrath upon you. Not because you don't deserve it. I deserved it. We all deserve it. But because he is long-suffering. And what we have here is exceptional. Because normally, God doesn't work in this way. The Bible tells us, Paul tells us in Romans, that God stores up his wrath against sinners, those who rebel against him, for a day yet to come. There will be a day of reckoning. There is a day when God deals with sin in those who have rejected him. We call it the day of the Lord or the day of judgment. And then everyone will appear before him. And those who have, like Pharaoh, continued to their last breath to have said in their heart and to demonstrated it with their life, who is the Lord? Why should I listen to a word he has to say? Rather, he should listen to what I've got to say and let me sit in judgment on him. All who continue with that attitude to their dying breath, to their last moment, will appear before him for this judgment of eternal death in hell. God stores that up, and that day is coming. That day is coming. We don't know when, but Paul, when preaching in Acts 17, said this to, to the congregation, to the philosophers on Mars Hill. <coughs> God has been patient, but God commands you to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. And he'll do it by the man he has appointed. And he has proved that this will happen by raising this man from the dead. And on that last day, uh, we will appear before Christ. And there will be, for those who have rejected him, this judgment. And what happened in... Egypt that night was a warning to us today about the seriousness of sin and that such a day will come for all of us if we do not repent. You see, we think of our legal system uh, and we think of a crime, for example, uh, and there's generally a punishment that goes with that crime uh, of a certain you know, amount of years in prison or whatever. But there's a standard punishment for a particular crime. But you may get an occasion where, you know, the jury obviously has the responsibility to find the person guilty or not guilty. But if the jury finds the person guilty, it is then in the power of the judge to determine the sentence. What punishment should be visited upon this person who has been found guilty of the crime? And you may have an occasion where the judge says, now normally this sentence is given for this crime. But today... I'm going to make an exception because I need to make an example of this individual because perhaps the crime that they've been found guilty of, people have grown rather indifferent to it and they don't think much of it. And perhaps the judge says, I need to come down hard on this to send a message that this is serious. And that's what was happening in the land of Egypt. And we find it, for example, in Sodom and Gomorrah and with the flood. God doesn't do that normally, does he? They were exceptional events where God makes an example of a particular group of people, a particular generation or whatever, to say, in grace, don't forget sin is serious. Don't forget what the wages of sin are. Remember where this will lead you. And so what happened that night was a judgment on those people, but it's a warning to us. God doesn't have to warn us. God doesn't have to wait. But he does. 
That's a gracious God. He warns us. He gives us time. Perhaps the question for you this morning is, what are you going to do with God's patience? Because again, it says in the New Testament, there will be those who, I paraphrase, spurn God's kindness. There will be those who waste God's patience. And that will only add to the judgment on the last day. A time will come, as it was for Pharaoh. He had that warning. He had time. He had time. He had time. He wouldn't listen. And time was up. And that will come for you, if you're not careful. God waits. God warns. God is patient. But the time will come when there is no more opportunity to turn. And it will be the final judgment. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near, because he's a God who delights to show mercy, and you'll find him ever ready to forgive. If only you will come and say, I'm not Lord of my life. You are. Take me. Take my life. And let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Disaster prophesied. Secondly, deliverance promised. Chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. There was going to be, uh, verse 6, a great cry. In chapter 11, sorry. There was going to be, in verse 6, a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. But the Lord says in verse 7 of chapter 11 that not everyone will endure this great judgment but against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue. It's a wonderful image, isn't it? It's going to be such devastating judgment for the people of Egypt, and yet the Lord says, for my people, they won't even have to have a dog barking at them. What a contrast, you know? A great cry, people of Egypt, a cry of devastation and destruction. For my people, they won't even get a dog yapping at their feet. That's the protection that I will give them. The Lord says, I will spare my people this judgment. They will not endure my wrath. They shall be preserved. And the point that must be emphasized is this. By nature, the children of Israel deserved God's judgment, as did the Egyptians. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By nature, from the fall, Adam's fall, every single human being, Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, being the only exception from amongst the human race, every single human being is born a sinner. And we are all, by nature, subject to God's judgment. So the, Egypt, sorry, the children of Israel were safe that night, not because they didn't deserve it, but the people of Egypt did. They were safe that night because of God's sovereign grace. God said, I will spare my people. There was a decision made, a determination from God. I will make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. God makes this decision, this decree, you might say. But even then, something had to happen before they could be saved and spared. God makes a determination, a, a decree, and then he provides a way of escape. And that way is outlined for us in chapter 12, isn't it? And it seems such a simple and for any of us not particularly familiar with Christianity, it might seem a rather strange answer to the problem and a way of escape. Chapter 12 and verse 3, speak, God says to Moses, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb. There's the answer. <laughs> That's how you will be safe when um, the, 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 the judgment comes to Egypt. You'll be safe because you've taken a lamb. 
Well, that lamb had to fulfill certain criteria, didn't it? It had to meet certain conditions. Uh, firstly, in verse 5 of chapter 12, the lamb had to be spotless, perfect, no defect or um, uh, deformity in any way. Your lamb shall be without blemish. So it had to be a perfect lamb. Secondly, that lamb had to be killed. Any old lamb, no good. A perfect lamb. A perfect lamb alive, no good. We read verse uh, 6. You shall keep this lamb, this spotless lamb that you've preserved. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Why? Why would they have to kill it? Why would a, a lamb alive not be good enough? Well, what was the judgment going to be? What is the penalty of sin? What are the wages of sin? Death. And if they were going to be spared, if the children of Israel were going to be spared the judgment, because they were sinners, so they had sin to answer for, if they were going to be spared that judgment, that penalty had to be meted out, didn't it? The punishment had to be given for the crime of sin. Death had to fall. But here's the answer, you see. That lamb will be the substitute. That lamb will take the judgment. That lamb will bear the wrath, as it were, for sin instead of them. And so the lamb has to die because death is the penalty of sin. And so that lamb must pay the price, so to speak, for them to escape. A perfect lamb slain. Then there was something else. The blood of that lamb then had to be, verse 7 of chapter 12, applied to the doorposts and the lintel of the houses. And, you heard that, I'm sure, also they had to eat the flesh. Point I should have made, sorry, thinking about the lamb taking the judgment in their place. It's interesting, that lamb was to be cooked with fire, wasn't it? What's fire? A symbol of God's judgment. And so the cooking of it's very specific. You think, why does God specify, you know? Um, it's got to be, you know, why does God you give them the recipe, even if you're like, you know, you've got to have the lamb and let me tell you how to cook it. Um, fire, again, a symbol. This lamb is bearing God's judgment in their place. But then they had to apply the blood of the lamb that had been slain to their, to their homes, the doorposts, Sorry, the doorposts and the lintel. And then they had to eat the lamb. That's interesting again. Why does God say they have to eat the lamb? Two things here. One thing really, but uh, illustrated in two ways. They were, by doing that, to personally appropriate this lamb to themselves. You see, by applying the doorpost and the lintels, they were saying, they were putting it, if you like, over the house. This blood now is over their house, covering their house. And by doing that, they had to do it. They had to, with their own hands, apply the blood. And so they were saying in that, as it was a symbolic act, they were saying to the Lord, Lord, as you pass through the land of Egypt tonight in judgment, we recognize our only hope of safety and salvation and deliverance is the death of this lamb. We recognize that other than this, we've had it. We are putting our faith in the death of this lamb, in the shed blood of this lamb for our salvation. And then by eating the lamb, they were taking it, as it were, into themselves. It was, again, it was a symbolic act of faith. We're putting our confidence in this lamb. Its blood is on our doorposts and lintel. We're feeding on it. And Jesus picks that image up, doesn't he, when he speaks about, you must eat my flesh. He wasn't a cannibal. He wasn't suggesting that. He was speaking about, that in, particularly in Jewish thought, if you ate something, you were taking it in. You were become, it was becoming part of you. And this was an act of faith. A perfect lamb, slain, and then this blood and eating it and so on was, we are pinning all our hopes on this. Lord, look at the blood. Lord, remember the lamb. 
when you pass through that night. And that was the only way of escape. God says in verse 12 of chapter 12, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. Verse 13, now the blood should be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. What's the difference maker? What's their only way of escape? The blood applied to the doorposts and the lintel. And the Lord, in a sense, when he passes through, will say, I don't need to go there. Judgment's already been meted out on that house, on the lamb. My wrath has already been poured out on that house, on the lamb that was slain. And just as the disaster prophesied in chapter 11 was a real historical event and a foretaste of something yet to come, so here. Because that was a real historical event, but it was a foretaste of something God had prepared. And it's why I gave the title, I don't know if the title came up earlier, it's why I gave the title to the sermon, Christ, Our Passover. Because the Apostle Paul, that, that's not my um, wording, that's taken from Paul, uh, chapter 5 of his first letter to the Corinthians, where he describes the Lord Jesus, God's Son, as our Passover. And it's interesting, when John the Baptist is baptising, where he got his name from, when John the Baptist is baptizing at the Jordan and his relative Jesus of Nazareth comes, how does John introduce him to the crowd? Behold, look at this. Fix your eyes. Behold the Lamb of God. Powerful image. And what he's saying is this, quite simply, the prophecy of Passover is fulfilled. And we have it so often. God said to me, I'll provide a lamb for the burnt offering and so on. And all this, the incident here, the sacrificial system with Moses, what happened with Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah and so on, all that was God telling his people, preparing the way for another lamb, a metaphorical lamb who would come and bear the judgment forever, the full final judgment against the sin of his people on their behalf because Christ and his work on the cross fulfills everything we read here what did that lamb have to be if the people were going to be saved they needed a lamb to represent them they needed a lamb to take the punishment in their place Jesus Christ is the lamb says John but what kind of lamb was he not just any old lamb would do it had to be a perfect lamb and how does Peter in his first letter, describe Jesus Christ. A lamb without blemish and without defect. It's a deliberate reference to Exodus 12. Jesus is that Passover lamb, spotless, the only member of the human race who is not subject to judgment by nature. The only member of the human race who has no sin. perfect, spotless, the only one qualified to be our saviour. That's why Christmas is such a big deal, because if Christmas had never happened, we would have no hope, because he's the only one. The hope of all the world rests on this man, and praise God he came, spotless. That's why it's so important that the scriptures emphasise his sinlessness, because one sin would have disqualified him. Praise God there wasn't one. And that lamb, Jesus Christ, oh, as perfect as he was, and he was perfect, as wonderful as his teaching was, as marvelous as his miracles were, a Jesus who stayed alive and then was taken up to heaven would have been no good for us. Because we needed someone to pay the price of sin for us, and the price of sin is death. And so Jesus Christ died. His blood was shed. 
It's a question for us. We have the Lamb. He is spotless. He's been uh, slain. His blood has been shed. Have you done the equivalent of verses 7 and 8? I'm not speaking literally here now. But have you applied his blood to your soul? Have you fed on this lamb? What I mean quite simply is, have you put all your confidence, all your faith, all your trust in him as your saviour? Have you said, Lord, you've provided the lamb because it was God's way of escape? The, the Israelites didn't come up with this themselves, did they? They didn't say, Lord, we know you're going to come through the land of Egypt tonight, so we've come up with a way that perhaps would keep us alive. And God says, let me have a look at it. Yeah, okay, I'll do that. No, this was God's idea. This was God's way and the only way. And so Jesus Christ and his death at the cross is God's way and it's the only way. Have we responded to that? Have we said, Lord, I believe that you will rightly visit judgment on your enemies. And Lord, I've come to see, and I'd rather I hadn't, but in a way I'm glad I have. <laughs> I've come to see that that's what I am. I've come to see my heart. Oh, it's a big thing in our culture today, isn't it? Find yourself. The only way we find ourselves is in the conviction of sin. That's where we see ourselves. And you say, Lord, this is my heart. And Lord, when you visit judgment, I have no hope, Lord, but I've heard of a way. I've heard of a saviour. I've heard of a lamb. And Lord, I can hardly believe that you would ever forgive me. But that's what you've said. That's what you promised. And so that's what I'm going to do. And you say with the tax collector in the parable, simply, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Look on Christ. Remember Christ. Lord, I ask you to remember his death. I ask you to remember his sacrifice for me. And on the basis of that alone, Lord, I come to you with all my sin and pray you would forgive me. Have you applied Christ's work to your own soul. It's happened. Have you applied it? If we're believers here this morning, isn't it wonderful to think what the Lord has done for us? When we think of what we deserve, when we think of where we would be if it were not for him, doesn't it just want, make you want to, at least in your hearts, get on your knees and say, thank you, Lord, for saving me. What we have been saved from. <laughs> yes, we, we focus rightly on what we have been saved for. But friends, what we have been saved from. A place on that day where there's, there'll be a cry unlike anything ever heard before. We've been spared that. We won't have to face that. That'll never come near us. God's wrath has been poured out on Christ. It's been exhausted in him. Nothing left for us to face. We are free. We're forgiven. We're cleansed. We are saved. And I finish with this. Verse 14. An instruction was given. So this day, this Passover day, shall be to you a memorial. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. God said to his people there, um, the children of Israel here, I want you to remember this night and this day. And I want your children and your children's children, those who weren't there, I want this to be remembered. I want you to remember the penalty of sin. I want you to remember the grace of the Lord. And they had, didn't they, a Passover meal that they had by an annual ordinance to remember what happened that night, their deliverance from judgment. And here now, friends, in the New Covenant, we have a Passover meal. We call it the Lord's Supper. 
when again we remember a lamb slain for our redemption. That's why the Lord's Supper is such a means of grace, isn't it? Because every time we take it, we're reminded we're brought back to a place of judgment and a place of mercy for the people of God. This is good news. Sounds a heavy passage when you read it, isn't it? This is good news. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. And I do pray that we are one in our faith in this Lamb.